I've had these aftermarket rear shocks installed for about a year or so, and they have continued to perform well over that time. My original shocks began to leak oil, and as they are non-serviceable, the only thing I could do was to replace them. I found these on a really great site for CM450 parts. It's 4into1.com. I'll post the link in the description box if you're interested. I bought them for around $90, and they're still available around that price today. These shocks have progressive spring and inverted design, and a rebound as well as preload adjustment capability. The stock shocks were preload adjust only, so I get a little more tunability with these. These are the original shocks from 1982. They lasted a very long time and have performed really well. You can see where the oil had leaked out of this one, so unfortunately it was time for it to go. I'm going to remove a shock and reinstall it to help anyone out there who might be interested in doing this on their bike. Be sure the bike is on its center stand, or if you don't have a center stand, just make sure the rear tire is off the ground with the bike supported by jacks. Do not attempt to remove the shocks with the rear tire touching the ground. The first step will be to take off any preload you have set up. On the aftermarket shocks, that means loosening up a set screw and then using this metal rod to loosen up the preload adjuster. If you are removing the stock suspension, the preload is adjusted at the base of the shock. You use a spanner wrench like this one to loosen the end cap. With the preload off, I like to loosen up the lower mounting bolt and upper mounting bolt nut before I remove them completely. This is just something I do to check the condition of the threads. This area can be prone to rust, especially if the bike is stored outdoors. And if they felt really stuck, I would know to use some PB blaster or some other chemical penetrant. I'll start by fully removing the lower bolt. As you do this, the swing arm will want to fall downwards slightly and once both shocks are out it will drop to the ground. This is why I recommend only swapping out one shock at a time. That way the swing arm will always stay pretty much in position. It's not a big deal if the swing arm does drop since it's pretty lightweight but if you're worried about it you can put a block of wood or something underneath the tire to keep the swing arm from falling down too far. Again, if you only do one side at a time, this should not be an issue. Once the bolt is out, you can easily slide the lower mount out of the way. You'll notice that I have a copper washer in place. I found that the base of the aftermarket shock mount was just a little bit wider than stock. So I used a hammer to pound a copper washer until it fixed the tolerance issue. I don't think this really makes any difference when it comes to performance or reliability, but it's something I wanted to do anyway. Next, we can remove the mounting nut from the upper portion of the shock. You'll notice that we are unable to remove the shock from the mounting shaft because our grab bar rail is in the way, so we will have to remove it before proceeding. Don't forget about the washers and the order in which you remove them. The grab bar rail is held in place with two bolts in addition to the two nuts at the top of either shock. We will have to remove the two bolts and the other nut from the opposing shock. The bolts are held in place with a nut that is exposed just underneath the wheel well as can be seen here. To remove it, just use two wrenches or ratchets, one inside the wheel well and one outside of it. Do the same for the bolt on the other side as well. Finally, loosen or remove the outer shock mounting nut and the grab rail will simply lift off the bike and be out of the way. There will be a spacer washer on either side of your upper shock mount. Be sure to keep track of the order that they go on. And just like this, the grab bar rail will lift right off nice and easy. Don't forget to keep track of all those washers you find, as well as the order you remove them in. Since this shock is still fairly new, its rubber bushing provides a very tight fitting onto the mounting shaft. To remove it, I gently wiggle the shock while pulling on it until it's free. It looks like the rubber bushing stayed behind, so I have to pull that one off as well. It comes off with a little bit of effort. You will perform the same procedure on the other side once you have replaced the shock on this side of the bike. You don't want to take both of them off at the same time. It's a good idea to inspect the upper and lower shock mounts. I have a little bit of rust and rust pitting as well as a little bit of rust on the threads. It doesn't look too bad though, so I'm not concerned. The lower mount has a bushing pressed into place. The bushing uses rubber and thankfully mine are still in good shape. Pressing these out and finding replacements would be an adventure in itself should they ever need replacing. Before doing a reinstallation, I just want to go over a few differences between the stock shocks and the aftermarket ones that I'm using, as well as cover an important setup procedure I had to do before installing them on the bike. Aside from the visual differences, the biggest technical factors that separate these two shocks would be the inverted design that creates less unsprung weight, a highly adjustable preload range versus the handful of indexed positions on the stock shocks, and the ability to adjust the rebound rate versus no adjustment capability on the stock ones. They both have progressive dual rate springs, but their spring rate is noticeably different on the road. When riding two up, the aftermarket shocks seem to handle the extra weight a lot better as well. So overall, I do prefer the aftermarket shocks to 
the stock ones. The special setup step that I needed to do with the aftermarket shocks was to adjust the eye to eye length. The length was fixed on the stock setup, but the new shocks have an adjustable length that needs to be set up. The eye to eye length is measured on the stock setup from center to center like this. And then that value must be matched on the new suspension component. So we are going to measure the length of the stock shock and adjust this shock until it matches the same length. To make the adjustment is easy enough. There is a lock nut that holds the adjuster in place. And once loosened up, the entire lower shock mount will rotate, increasing or decreasing its eye to eye length. You would use a wrench or a crescent wrench to loosen up that lock nut and then just rotate the mount until the eye to eye length is what you want it to be. After that, just tighten the lock nut back up and it's good to go. Before we leave the bench, let's see how to adjust the preload on the stock shocks. Just take a spanner wrench and insert it into the adjustment collar and rotate it in either direction to make a change. That's all the adjustability you can do with the stock shock. By comparison, the aftermarket shock is easier to work with and you can make a much finer adjustment. Just loosen up the set screw and rotate the adjuster to make the change you desire. Retighten the set screw and it's all set. Rebound adjustments can be made on the aftermarket shock just by turning the dial on the bottom. One direction slows the rebound rate and the other direction speeds it up. I keep mine in the middle and it works well enough for me. As a final note, the shocks that I ordered came with a set of bushing inserts. These are designed to slip into the shock eyelet bushings and help increase the compatibility of these shocks with different bikes. For instance, the shock mounting shaft on certain bike frames might be a little smaller diameter than it is on the CM450. So these extra bushings will fill in that extra space and allow the shocks to fit properly. As a note, the CM450 did not need to use these bushings. Everything fit right out of the box. With all this bench stuff out of the way, let's get back to the reinstallation. For reinstallation, I like to put a little bit of this rubber safe silicone lube on all rubber bushings. It helps with the installation and provides a little bit of lubrication for a few months before it evaporates away. Be careful of the kind of grease that you choose to use. Just make sure that it's rubber safe or else the rubber bushings can become damaged over time. Pop the bushing back into the upper eye of the shock and don't forget to put all the washers back in the order you remove them in. In this case, I need to put the large washer on first, followed by the shock body itself. The silicone lube makes this much easier to install than it was when I first tried to remove it. I then have another large washer to put on, followed by this slightly smaller washer. Next, we can toss on the grab bar rail. Don't worry about installing the bolts right away. The end fitting will hold it in place when positioned over the upper shock mount bolts. Now I have a final outside washer to pop on, and then I like to use a little bit of medium strength thread lock to make sure the mounting nut doesn't come loose. I just use a tiny bit and it gives me a sense of security on the road. You can install the nut hand tight, but don't torque it down just yet. Next, we can install the lower eye bolt onto the shock. Again, I like to put a little bit of thread locker onto the threaded section of the shock mount for that added sense of security. On the bolt itself, I like to put a little bit of synthetic grease on there to help it out, but I avoid getting any on the threads because that would render the thread lock inoperable. Since I'm using this homemade copper spacer washer, I'm going to make sure I get it aligned and installed as well. The swing arm is probably dropped down a little bit from not having any support bolt in place. You may need to lift it up a little on the wheel or the swing arm itself to get the bolt to slip into place more easily. At this point, I can pop the copper washer into place and start threading the bolt in. You'll want to do this by hand at first. Just make sure you are not cross threading the connection. Once you're sure it's well connected, you can snug it up by hand with a socket. Don't torque it down all the way just yet though. Go ahead and install the shock on the other side in the same way. With both shocks installed and in position, we can reattach the grab bar to the rail bolts. I like to put a little grease on the bolt to combat corrosion and then use the same two wrenches or ratchets to tighten up the nut on the end of the bolt using one from underneath the wheel well and one on the outside. I also use a little drop of thread lock on the nut just for that added insurance out on the road. I'm not aware of any torque specs for this nut, but I would say snug is good enough, especially if you have a drop of thread lock in place. Finally, it's time to tighten up the upper and lower connectors to the recommended torque of 22 to 29 foot pounds. I'm setting my torque wrench to 25 foot pound and making sure the top and bottom are buttoned up well. Don't forget to do the same thing on the other shock and the bike should be ready for a road test.